Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Trek Cannon, Midnight Edition. So, first I wanted to say, uh, I was asked, what's the difference between my Midnight Editions and my normal <laughs> bootlegs, you know, my normal uh, reviews or things like that. And simply put, my Midnight Editions is more for my um, adult audiences, it, it, or it handles more adult themes, or darker themes that may be a little bit too adult for my younger viewers or for younger people to watch so, and I might let a few uh, few of my Swahili colorful metaphors as Spot might say fly a little bit freer so today's video was a recommendation from one of uh, my subscribers uh, and I thought it was a pretty interesting topic to cover because one um, it deals with uh, my favorite series Deep Space Nine of course two uh, it deals with a person who you rarely ever get too much information on, especially in YouTube videos, all right? And three, it's just an interesting topic, man, and I like to dive into it. So, Mr. Arceus, the creator, this is for you, man, and thanks for subscribing. So, today we're going to be discussing Miss Sarah Cisco. all right? Now, who is Sarah Cisco? Sarah Sisko is Captain Benjamin Sisko, biological mother. Now, he has a stepmother that he grew up with, and that was the only mother he was aware of until way later in his life. But Sarah Sisko uh, was his biological mother, and uh, we're going to be talking about uh, her. We're going to be talking a little bit about her history, how she incorporated herself into the Sisko family, the role she plays in the story of the Space Nine and her place in the Celestial Temple. Okay, so and, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about with her was um, I wanted to go, I wanted to dive deep into the scenario of what she did, the repercussions um, of what she did, the impact of the people, the impact on the people involved in what Sarah uh, Cisco did. So Without any further ado, let's get on into it, baby. Let's do this. So, Sarah Cisco was born in June. Of, I mean, uh, Sarah Cisco was uh, born on Earth. She is human. All right. She met Joseph Cisco, which is uh, Captain Cisco's dad. You guys know him. He runs the Creole restaurant in uh, New Orleans. And I really want to taste this gumbo. I, I really want to taste his uh, jambalaya, at, I mean, his uh, shrimp at, uh, his shrimp etouffee I, and his gumbo. Because I'm going to tell you what, I love it. Anyway, I love gumbo. But anyway, so she met him in Jackson Square in 2331. And not too long after, a few months after, they got married. All right. And Joseph Sisko himself describes the relationship as being the happiest time of his life. Now, we'll get into that, like I said, a little bit later, but he describes the uh, he describes his relationship to Sarah as being the happiest time of his life, all right? And that includes even being married, uh, after being remarried um, to his later wife, okay? Now, they spent a couple of years being married and shortly after, Ben Sisko was born, all right? Now, the thing is, is that about a year after um, Cisco's birth, she disappeared. She left. All right. She 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 left Joseph Cisco. She left Ben Cisco. She just ghosted. She was out. All right. Now, the thing is, is that Cisco Joseph Cisco uh, he was caught off guard by that. And like I said, I'm gonna get into that a little bit in the repercussion side of this in, in the repercussion side of the video. But he was kind of caught, you know, so put off by that that he tried uh, everything he could to find her and figure out why, try to find some closure, try to figure out what was going on. This was the love of his life, all right? Now, he ended up tracking her down in Australia where she uh, worked as a, I believe, a, um, a hologram photographer, uh, a, you know, for uh, taking pictures for, that would be used on holidays. And uh, he decided that he was going to go and 
confront her about it and figure out if he could get the love of his life back or at least figure out what happened, you know? And about a month before he could do that, she died in a, a accident in Australia. And I believe it was a um, hovercraft accident. So now let, let me, let me again say that there's going to be spoilers in the story of Deep Space Nine, but because of the intricacies and the, uh, um, the multilayerism of the characters, this particular piece of t this particular video shouldn't uh, spoil that much. But just so you know, there will be spoilers in the story as far as as it pertains to her, and a little bit as it pertains to Cisco. All right, so I just want you guys to be aware of that. Now, the thing is, is that she left being a locket. She left him a little amulet. All right, but. He didn't know anything about it until way later in his life. Now, before I continue on with this story, I need to kind of, kind of give a um, a slight, I say, introduction or bio of the wormhole aliens or the prophets. All right. Now, there are two sects of uh, the beings known as prophets. You have the prophets; they reside in the uh, in the uh, wormhole or in the celestial temple, as the Bajorans call it, by their religion. And you have the pa Wraiths, which is uh, the benevolent form of the prophets, less powerful, and they reside, or well, they are caged in the uh, fire caves on Bajor. Now, it's very important to understand that power struggle. And it's basically um, the same type of power struggle uh, uh, for deities throughout science fiction, throughout religion, throughout all of that. You have your depictions of heaven and you have your depictions, uh, your representations, I should say, of hell. The pirates are the representations of hell. Evil. Things that are bad. Okay? Or as uh, O'Neill and Daniel was explaining to the uh, Tolans that one time, he, he's just, they just, they just, they're just bad. We want to talk to them about all of the bad, the bad stuff that they've been doing, that he's been doing. You know, just bad. Okay, so the wormhole aliens and the pirate, their species, are they exist um, outside linear time. Now, linear time is how we all experience time one event after the next, after the next, after the next, in a linear progression, in a line progression, all right, in a straight progression. So, the thing about the wormhole aliens, they don't do that. They can experience they experience their existence simultaneously. So all points in time they are conscious of, they exist in, they can affect. All right. So I know that's gonna be a little hard for people to wrap their heads around, okay? But if you sit down and really try to think about it, um, you could kind of consider it a different being a being of a different dimension. All right. So who are true fourth dimensional beings. But fourth dimension is the time and they have complete access of that particular dimension. So I guess it's safe to say they're fourth dimensional beings. Now, there's a constant power struggle between the power rates and the, uh, the uh, uh, profits, all right? And the thing is that it boils down to the profits wanting to uh, eternally cage the pirates, rendering them powerless in the future. All right, and or as you or since they are nonlinear throughout the story, and the pirates trying to render the celestial temple inert. Okay, throughout their particular perception of eternity. Now, one can say because of the events of D Space Nine that the uh, prophets or the wormhole aliens were far better at their manipulation of linear time and their understanding of linear time than the pirates. Now I'm gonna get into that, like I said, a little bit later in the story. But I wanted to talk about the repercussions of what happened in this situation, all right? Because they gloss over it in the story of Deep Space Nine. But if we were just to peel, peel back just some of the layers and go into go deep into what actually happened 
it was pretty fucked up. All right. It was pretty messed up. So think about this. Sarah, before she was inhabited by a wormhole alien, was going about her life. Okay. We know that she didn't ask to be inhabited by a prophet. Okay. Because it was never stated in canon that that was part of her religion, that she even knew about them. All right. So we can safely assume that her inhabitation or her possession by the uh, wormhole alien was forced upon her. All right. That's one aspect. So an entity forced itself upon you. Now, it doesn't really go into if she was conscious during this time of the events that took place or if she her consciousness was sent back into a stasis type of thing in a celestial temple. But either way, we know that this isn't something that she wanted. And we know this because after the pirate, after the um, prophet left her, all right, she left the family. She left her child. She left her husband. She left that life. Okay. Now, think about that. You just wake up one day and you're laying in a bed next to a person that you have never seen before. You hear a baby crying. And it is a baby you have never seen before. You're in a house you have never seen before. There are pictures of you and this family, these people that you don't remember taking. Again, that you have never seen before. All right. Now, I can only imagine the trauma that would come out of a situation like that. Uh, realizing a situation like that, you know, and um I couldn't imagine how she felt. Well, I, I can't. Well, I can imagine a situation, but I can't imagine how she felt being in that situation. Right. So she left. Right. No word. Nothing like that. Now. Think about it from Joseph's perspective, Joseph Cisco. He wakes up and let's say, for instance, he wakes up and she was just gone. But what does he think? You know, now. I, b I believe I remember either somewhere in canon or in a non-canon um, piece of literature where they go into, uh, I guess, that particular day with Cisco, with uh, Sarah and Joseph Cisco. And in this account, it's basically like um, she was telling them, hey, man, I don't know who you are. And she left. But that would negate him trying to find her later, as as uh, as stated in the uh, in actual canon episodes. So we're gonna say that he woke up and she was just gone. All right. Now, can you imagine if he had actually had a chance to find her and talk to her and realize that she had no idea who he was, the life that she had shared with him for the last few years? The marriage that they had, the love that they shared, the kid that they had, you know, all the goals and everything that they had put together and, and all of the wishes and all of those things, all of the experiences that they shared, the memories that they had, she would not know any of this. Every time he showed her a picture, she would think he was crazy. All right. He would like, can you imagine the amount of heartbreak and confusion that that would cause in Joseph's life? Of course, he would opt for, to forget about her because he he would think. She forgot about him. Can you imagine what they did to his confidence? You know what I mean? Like, your wife doesn't even know you. I can, the only way that I can uh, relate that to something today would be a person who is married to someone with uh, Alzheimer's, okay? Which my aunt um, unfortunately had. And it was a terrible experience because a lot of times she didn't recognize who we were. Okay, she didn't recognize who my sister was all the time. That was weird. But her her husband, um, uh, some of the, a lot of the other immediate family, it'd be times that she'd be like, "Who are you?" Like, "Oh, get away from me!" And we have to kind of try to explain to her and make her remember. And sometimes it would work, and sometimes it didn't. But in his case, in Joseph Cisco's case, it wouldn't have worked at all. So. 
we fast forward linearly through Cisco's life to where uh, he has left Starfleet. He's lost Dax. He's feeling real bad. He went. He goes back to Earth. All right, and he finds this locket. Well, his grandfather gives him the locket after he reluctantly tells uh, Cisco about his biological mother. So, on the back of the locket is ancient Bajoran writing. Long story, you know, long story short, he ends up deciphering this and finds that on a planet called uh, Tyree. Don't quote me on that, but you might want to quote me on that because I'm awesome when it comes to Star Trek knowledge. But it tells him basically to go to this planet called Tyree. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Now, remember back at the beginning of the video, I was talking about how the power, I mean, how the uh, prophets seemed a lot better at, at understanding and manipulating time, linear time, than the power rates. Okay? This is what I mean. The prophets knew what was going to happen as far as the power rates going into the celestial temple. And they knew it was going to be a balance of struggle, which would cause what happened to happen. And I'm trying not to get too much into spoilers, all right? But they needed an ace in the hole. They needed a trump card. So what did they do? Or what did Sarah do? And I'm curious if this, if this is something Sarah did. And I'm thinking, you know, in retrospect, I'm thinking this is something that Sarah herself did. I'm sorry, the prophet that inhabited Sarah itself did. Because in the episode Emissary 1 and 2, when Cisco first run, ran across the Wormhole aliens, they didn't know him. Okay? They didn't know that he was their emissary. Um, they didn't know these things. And it's weird because if they did, which they should have known because they're not linear, um, they should have, they, they didn't give the impression that they knew who he was or what he was. All right. Now, if I make that inference, that would mean that the only person who knew in its entirety what was going to happen would have been the, uh, that one prophet, that one prophet, being and that one prophet being left the celestial temple and encased itself inside of the orb of the emissaries on Tyree. Now, that could be one assumption, or the other assumption could be just like they stated in the emissary one and two you exist here. Maybe they were trying to say, Hey, you're the emissary, but you're not the emissary you're supposed to be because right now you exist here, which was the board, which was the death of his wife. Okay. So we can look at it as either of those two ways. And if we look at it the latter way, that would, that would then mean that the prophet sent uh, Sarah to do this and then exiled her or contained her in an orb where she wouldn't be sensed uh, on the planet Tyree. Now, of course, Sarah is released and she goes and she excommunicates or exercises the power race from the wormhole, from the celestial temple. Okay. Now, and she, re and she rejoins her people in the celestial temple. Now, the thing is, is that of all the wormhole aliens, she has always been the the motherly figure in uh that appears to Cisco and that appeared to uh Cassidy Yates too to warn her that hey you guys shouldn't get married. Only sorrow can come of this. Okay. Now <clears throat> in the end episode of Deep Space Nine, she appears for the last time. And she says that his job is done, that he served his purpose. And his purpose was, spoiler, 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 his purpose was to forever contain the power rates. Okay, I'm not going to tell you how he did that, but that was his purpose. And he served that purpose, which I think makes him the most valuable or the most consequential of the emissaries that the prophets had had. And means that each prophet 
of the each emissary of the prophets <clears throat> was there to serve a specific reason, for a specific purpose for the specific time period that they were in. Now, Sarah Cisco welcomes her son home, okay? And she says that, and she allows him to basically say his goodbye to Cassidy Yates. And with that goodbye, I hope that, and with the way that that goodbye was worded, it left the door open for what I would hope would be the new incarnation of a Deep Space Nine series where he comes back, okay? Either a year from now or yesterday. It's not linear. What is it? My life. My destiny. The prophets saved me, Cassidy. I'm their emissary. And they still have a great deal for me to do. When will you be back? But it's hard to say. Maybe a year. <gasps> Maybe yesterday. So, I hope this gave a little bit of information on Sarah Cisco, uh, the prophet of the emissary, and the orb of the emissary. And, um, oh, there's one thing I wanted to let you guys know, and you probably didn't realize. For those of you who have seen Deep Space Nine all the way through the series, you may remember when, uh, you probably remember Benny, the flashbacks to Benny. Now, a lot of people may not know this, but... It wasn't the wormhole aliens, the prophets, that were responsible for those particular visions. It was the Pa Wraith. Yes, it was the Pa Wraith. So, let me know if you think that that's true. And if you don't, tell me why. And I can tell you uh, why you're wrong. No, and I can um, explain to you uh, uh, why it is that that was the case. So, as always, be cool, peace, recycle, and save the whales. Y'all take care.